All right, good morning, everybody. Our sound system's a little bit acting up today, but we'll be okay for the talk. I just want to um, uh, introduce our introducer, who will be uh, Stephen Higgins, who is the director of the Vermont Center for Behavior and Health, and he's going to talk about our Grand Round speaker today. And this Grand Rounds is co-sponsored by the Department of Psychiatry and the VCBH. Also want to let you know there'll be a lunch after with Dr. Fiore and back at the UHC in the usual place, which is maybe Arnold for, oh gosh, for something, fourth floor. We'll, we'll tell you eventually. We can, nobody can remember the numbers, especially not when public speaking. Um, 4325. 4325. Alrighty. And here's Dr. Higgins. Thank you, Julie. Well, it is really a, an honor to be able to introduce our speaker today, uh, Michael Fury, the Hill, uh, University of Wisconsin Hildale Professor of Medicine. Um, the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health, where he was a colleague and friend with our Dean Rick Page. So uh, they had a chance to, to chat today, which was wonderful. Um, Michael has directed the prestigious uh, University of Wisconsin Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention since 1992. 27 years, and I saw him chatting with John Hughes, and so John and I have been around and reading that research during the entire time, and they really uh, are a, an amazing group. They publish landmark uh, articles. I won't bore you with details, but I can think of a handful uh, immediately that are just classic papers, and you know, I know influenced me and have influenced a lot of people in our field. He is known for many contributions, but especially his work chairing the panels that produced the United States Public Health Service clinical practice guidelines, treating tobacco use and dependence. He published, the first one came out in 1996, 2000 and 2008. When I was making these remarks, I thought we're due for another, and I think we may be hearing an update uh, today. Um, the, uh, Mike will also chair the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Subcommittee on Tobacco Cessation of the Interagency Committee on Smoking and Health that produced a comprehensive plan for promoting tobacco cessation in the U.S. In 2005, he was asked by the uh, U.S. Justice Department uh, as part of their, their landmark uh, lawsuit against the tobacco industry to craft a $130 billion, 25-year plan to assist 33 million smokers to quit. When I heard that budget, I thought, at first I just thought in, in a dreaming way, like, that budget. But then I thought, well, along with that budget is a lot of work and a lot of expectations. So I'm just so glad that Michael was willing to, to take that on for our field. Um, during his long and distinguished uh, medical and public health career at all at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he has served as the principal investigator on five consecutive NIH center grant applications. So he is a terrific uh, grantsman in addition to all the other things he does and was an inaugural recipient of the Nan National Cancer Institute Outstanding Investigator Award in 2015. Um, he is just a, a continuous, outstanding contributor, and it's um, no surprise to me that NCI would recognize him as such. He's the recipient of numerous other awards and honors, and in 2012 was elected to the National Academy of, Med of Medicine, um, the Institute of Medicine. Um, so, without any further ado, please help me give a warm welcome to Michael Fiore. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. I, I've got this. Oh, you're good. good. Yeah. Well, thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you all for inviting me here uh, to spend a day with you in Vermont. I am a New England boy. I was born in Boston. I went to college in Maine and um, did some of my best skiing in Vermont, so I'm very fond of the state. Um, I also, um, in my more professional capacity, um, have always seen Vermont as a leader in my world of tobacco control. Um, and I'm honored, Steve, that you introduced me. Um, uh, Steve is the PI on his second 
TCOR grant, which is the Tobacco Center of Regulatory Science grant funded by the FDA, an extremely prestigious but even more important grant that will help uh, to define how we use the capacity of the FDA to advance tobacco control. And Steve, um, your work is really instrumental in that and, and want to just give a voice to it. Um, I also um, want to acknowledge a 30-year-plus um, colleague and friend, and that's John Hughes. John, where are you, by the way? Uh, in the back corner, not surprisingly, he's a humble guy. Um, but um, John um, has been an incredible leader in the way we think about dependence broadly, but tobacco dependence specifically. Um, the Hughes and Hatsukami scale um, has been cited in zillions of uh, grants and in most publications on tobacco control. Um, he is an incredibly innovative and open thinker, um, and that to me is really unusual among scientists who become accomplished, and he is a decent person. And John, um, it's been a pleasure being your friend and colleague over these years, and thank you for helping me to be the best I can be in tobacco control. All right, so I'm going to talk today about um, cessation. Um, I'm not going to announce that there's a new PHS guideline coming out, Steve. For, sorry about that. <laughs> I actually think it's going to need new blood to, to get, some, uh, get that going. Um, but what I am going to talk about is the whole landscape of tobacco cessation. Um, I am um, passionate about helping people quit smoking and advancing the science around that. I'm trained as a general internist and a preventive medicine specialist, um, and I don't think there's anything that gives me more pleasure professionally uh, than working with a smoker over time and helping that individual to quit. Um, and I've been very committed to the notion that as clinicians, we have an obligation to address tobacco for what it is, a medical emergency, um, and something that we've, many of us have given ourselves a pass to not address consistently with every smoker who comes into our clinics. And that's a big part of what I focus on, is how we change the landscape of a clinical encounter to ensure that that tobacco user is identified and documented, but then something happens. We give them some sort of a dose of evidence-based treatment. Um, and I, am, uh, I view that as part of what the standard of care is. Um, I view it as part of the good doctor club. We would never allow a patient with a uh, systolic blood pressure of, of uh, 280 to leave our clinic without addressing it. But unfortunately, too often, we allow patients who are addicted to tobacco to come into our clinics and to leave it without getting treatment. And um, if I leave one message with all of you, it would be to think about a population-wide approach to ensure that every one of our patients receives some dose of tobacco treatment, whether they're willing to quit today or need to be motivated to quit tomorrow. Um, the last thing I'll just say before I, I dive in my slides is that while I am passionate about cessation and the clinical aspects of it, um, one thing I've learned particularly over the last decade is the power of cessation policies to really make a difference, maybe even more so than clinical work. Um, policies like you're considering in Vermont for Tobacco 21, uh, policies like increasing the price of tobacco 
because of uh, price elasticity, even in the face of this addictive substance, that it is really a powerful lever. The power of innovative media campaigns, the power of clean indoor air policies. We'll, we'll talk about um, all of these, but um, cessation isn't enough by itself clinically. We need to have a context that really promotes tobacco dependence through policy. So um, uh, this is the outline of my talk. Okay, am I... Help me with this. I'm a... Use the arrow keys? Yeah. All right. That's good. All right. So I'm going to review briefly the epidemiology of tobacco use. Some of the lessons of the last 50 years is we have um, worked to reduce tobacco use in the United States. I'm going to talk about some of the clinical strategies and then uh, the policy strategies around what's often referred to as the end game. How do we get smoking rates down to zero? And I think that's actually achievable and uh, with some um, messages around pulling it all together. So starting with the epidemiology, when we look at tobacco use rates in the United States, it really represents one of the seminal success stories of the 20th century from a public health perspective. Tobacco use rates fell from their peak in the low 40s um, in the 50s and early 60s to most recently the 2018 data down to 13.7% of all adults 18 and older. Uh, so it went from about 43% down to 13% where one third of where we were then. Um, and this has um, come with a lot of effort, including, of course, the people in this room, but um, on the policy side, on the clinical side, and on the prevention side, because we really have a success story around preventing kids from using combustible tobacco cigarettes. Unfortunately, we have a big problem on the e-cigarette side with kids. But um, this is a success story. And because the people in this room no longer smoke, and many of those who we hang out with no longer smoke, um, the power of this is, is sometimes missed because it's not us. Um, and I think it's really important to um, be particularly sensitive to that, and we'll talk about some of the disparities in a moment around tobacco use, to bring those all of us back, though, to where we were in the 50s and 60s, it was a totally different world. Tobacco use was ubiquitous. Um, everyone, including physicians, smoked. Um, rich and poor, um, white and black, it was common and it was ubiquitous. And to give you a sense of what it was like at that time, I've got a brief um, advertisement for a cigarette company back um, in the late 1950s. So I'm going to advance this, and you're going to make the volume work. Thank you very much. What cigarette do you smoke? You'll be interested to know how the doctors of America answered that question. Tens of thousands of doctors, doctors in all parts of the country, in every state of the union, doctors in every branch of medicine were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? In this nationwide survey of general practitioners, surgeons, throat specialists, diagnosticians, and so on, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Try Camels yourself. Make the one sensible cigarette test. Make your own 30-day camel mildness test in your T-zone. Smoke only camels for 30 days. Enjoy camels' rich, full flavor. And see how well camels agree with your throat. Pack after pack, week after week. See for yourself why camels are so popular with the doctors of America. Well, in fact, irrespective of the reference to a T-zone, um, uh, tobacco um, 
use then and now um, is the opposite of soothing uh, th for the throat. Um, I want to go now to today and just to highlight some of the data from Vermont that I was able to pull together. Um, you, know, you are at about 16% of adults. It represents just under 100,000 um, Vermont um, adults who smoke. And good to see that you are in the single digits on high school smoking. So Vermont, too, represents a success we've seen nationally. Um, I'm going to switch back to the United States and share with you this incredible line of progress. But as you see, um, if you apply a straight line to it, we've got a long ways to go to achieve the end game. Um, but while it looks pretty straight, if you really dig a little deeper, the declines have not been equal. And one of the things I did um, recently for the New England Journal of Medicine was to look at um, what the impact of a very aggressive set of policy changes will be on rates of smoking and their decline. Um, so I, I helped at the National Cancer Institute on tobacco policy during the Obama era. And so we did an analysis of that. And here's what we showed, that if you look at the slope, this is a, um, one of the tables from that New England Journal of Medicine perspective. If you look at the slope of decline, it's gradually increased since the Clinton era um, when the annual decline was um, 0.87 uh, percentage point down to a tripling of that during the Obama era. Um, and the implications of such a decline are enormous because if you apply the slope to Obama, we will get to zero in 2035. In contrast, if you apply the slope of the Clinton area, it'll take until 2070. And the activities that happened during the Obama era, a dollar per pack, national increased um, in tax, um, the smoke-free laws that were promoted, but particularly the FDA getting regulatory authority and funding to fund a mass media campaign all work together to really drive down smoking rates. So we've made enormous progress but that progress has not been equal. And one of the critically important stories, I think, for all of us is that some of the most disenfranchised members of our society are the ones now who smoke at the highest rate. So it's the poor, it's those with the least education, it's those with comorbid mental health and substance abuse diagnoses. And while in the past it was primarily defined by gender, race, ethnicity, it is now um, uh, with exceptions of Native Americans, uh, defined more by socioeconomic status. And we need to, in particular, remember that as we're dealing with um, underserved patients because they probably also smoke. I don't have to convince anyone in this room that the risks of tobacco are enormous. 30% um, of all cancer deaths directly caused by smoking, 30% of all cardiovascular deaths, 90% of all COPD. It has been determined that 50% of smokers, if they don't quit, are going to die from a disease directly caused by this smoking. And there is very little we do in medicine that carries with it a 50% mortality rate on average robbing individuals of 10 uh, to 15 years of life. So powerful. So what have we done um, to has resulted in this progress? And um, I was privileged to be a part of the production of the 2014 Surgeon General's Report, which was the 50th anniversary report of the original one in 1964, and it to told a very compelling story. I'm going to just give you the highlights of it. Um, that report concluded, for example, that since 64, 20 million Americans have been killed by tobacco, directly killed by tobacco. Just to put that in context, about 2 million Americans have been killed in all of the wars we have fought as a nation. And we've allowed 20 million to be killed.
by tobacco. This has happened because of the tobacco industry and their aggressive efforts to sustain the epidemic of continued tobacco use. It now has been linked to diseases in virtually every part of the body. We don't need to review them all today. It also kills those around smokers. About 50,000 Americans are killed per year from secondary smoke exposure, a compelling argument to make every environment smoke free. Um, sadly, women who smoke like men now die like men, and uh, rates of deaths among women from smoking are now equal to those of men. Um, we focus so much on the downstream impact, but smoking also is an acute risk factor for inflammatory issues, impaired immune function, um, and in part this is why it causes so much upper and lower respiratory tract disease. Um, while we've made incredible efforts in declining the rates of smoking, we still have disparities, which I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, comprehensive tobacco control works. Um, and uh, Vermont has a state-based tobacco control program that is key to that. Um, a really important message that was made in the 2014 report that to me really needs to be emphasized, the burning of tobacco is what is particularly deadly. I burn a cigarette, I generate about 8,000 chemicals, 50 of which are carcinogens. That toxic mix is what kills people. And it's important from an educational point of view because of the um, we're on the advent of a whole variety of products that are often referred to as harm reduction products. Um, they end up being incredibly emotional arguments. But we cannot forget that if I burn tobacco, I ingest into my upper and lower airway 8,000 chemicals, many of which are toxic, and we need to get the rates of combustible tobacco use to zero. Um, all right, let's talk about some of the clinical ways we could do this. This is a recent MMWR um, at the most recent uh, Great American Smokeout, which always occurs on the third Thursday of the month, and it updated um, tobacco product use and cessation indicators. And these are some of those findings. Um, when we survey smokers, they say they want to quit. Um, and that's really important. There are, are a lot of smokers out there who say, you know, I smoke and I love it. And um, what they do say instead is, I'm hooked, um, I've tried and I've failed, I feel badly about it, I feel badly about the costs, about the impact on my family, um, and they struggle with this enormously. Half of them try every year, and this is defined in this survey by making at least a full day without smoking. Um, it's a big challenge. Um, uh, and, and it's the, the hook of nicotine, which paradoxically is one of the most powerfully addictive substances, but is not the part that kills the person. It's the part that holds them and continues the administration of the other um, toxic chemicals. Most visit a primary care clinician, and if you add all the other clinicians they see, it's well above 75%. So think about this is a captured audience for us in healthcare, and we need to seize the moment that they come into our clinics. Um, many of them have been advised to quit, but only 30% or fewer leave with counseling and medicine for a quit attempt, which is the recommended treatment. Uh, it was mentioned the PHS guidelines, which have summarized all the literature, the most recent one in 2008, when we reviewed um, almost 9,000 articles. We've updated that in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm just, um, you know, highlight the big takeaways. This is not going to be a detailed clinical talk, but we know that there are three um, cornerstones to tobacco dependence treatment that we should provide brief evidence-based counseling. We should put the patient on one of the seven, one or more, I should say, of the seven FDA-approved medications. And we should change the architecture of our clinical environments such that it is 
a part of clinical care. From the moment the patient walks through the door to the medical assistant documenting tobacco use status to EHR-based prompts that alert the clinician that I've got a smoker in front of me um, to the um, after-visit encounters that they take away from them to the links to the external resources like the, the Vermont Quit Line. There needs to be an integrated system based approach to ensure that every smoker is identified and treated. The guideline talks about the five A's. We need to ask every patient who walks through our door if they smoke. We need to advise all smokers or tobacco users, I should say, to quit. We need to assess their willingness because there's different interventions if they're willing to make a quit attempt now versus later. Uh, the meat of the program is to assist them with counseling and medicine. That's really important, both of those, counseling and medicine. And finally, we need to arrange follow-up. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some innovations in uh, cessation. We're going to go through each of these. So starting with combining counseling and medication, I mentioned just a moment ago that there's additive benefits of combining the two. So this is one of the um, meta-analyses from the PHS guideline. I'm just going to walk us through this, but in every one of these meta-analyses, we have the reference, which is in this instance counseling alone, the character, which is adding medicine to counseling, the number of arms in the clinical trial, and then the odds ratio. What's the benefit or not with the 95% confidence intervals? If it doesn't include one, of course, it means that it's statistically significant. So what this says is that if you start with counseling and add medicine, you boost your success rates by about 70%, a really important argument to add to. And the converse is the case. So if you hear the reference group is medicines alone, you add counseling to that, you boost your success rates by 40%. So give both, counseling and medicine. Um, each individually are effective, but together they're more effective. Two medicines were shown to get above the rest of them, we use as the comparison here, um, the nicotine patch by itself. And we wanted to see if among all these medicines, are there any that are particularly good? And what we found is that varenicline by itself, a non-nicotine pill, and combination NRT. And we've moved in our setting and what we recommend nationally is that that should be your go-to medicines. Um, a lot of primary care clinicians are overwhelmed by all of these options. So what we say is use either varenicline or combo NRT. Make it simple. And make a smart set. Are you all on Epic, by the way? Excellent. So make a smart set that defines how to prescribe with a single click varenicline or combo NRT. And the combo NRT that we recommend is the patch along with the nicotine mini lozenge. They're like Tic Tacs, you've got an urge, you put them in your mouth, they're tolerable. The old lozenges were big and chalky, um, they come in mint and cherry, um, smokers love them, um, um, and they have something to turn to when they have an urge. So either varenicline um, or combo NRT. And this is the analysis that showed them statistically better than the reference group in this instance, um, the nicotine patch. All right, treatment extenders. We talk about this a lot, the idea that the clinician has an obligation to address it, but we all know that a, a primary care physician is not going to spend 15 minutes counseling. So we need to be able to link them to community resources. And one key one is the quit line. Another one that we'll talk about in a few minutes is smokefree.gov um, and the suite of services that the NCI provides to people. Um, I took a, a few moments and, and looked at your quit line, and we'll talk about that in a second. But as you can see, um, quit lines had about a 60% boost in quit rates. And by the way, all of these quit rates are long-term, um, out uh, six months. Um, so these are six-month quit rates for all of the meta-analyses we did in the PHS guideline. So quit line counseling was effective relative uh, to a control condition. And one nice thing is that adding um, quit lines to medication by itself also was a statistically significant finding 
um, boosting just giving medicine by itself by about 30%. Um, here is some information about your quit line. Um, you've got a very nice website. It was great to see that. Uh, we pulled a few of the clips from it. Um, and um, you, yeah, again, materials for people. I love that you go down to age 13. Um, this was also on your website. I know I don't have to tell you about the uh, Vermont quit line, but um, the degree to which you build in the referring of those patients to hardwire that to your clinical encounters, I think, is where we fall short. Um, that we need to have it be the default. That it's an automatic referral, an opt-out kind of approach. Um, we long ago started with fax to quit. Um, many of the younger people in the audience probably don't know what a fax machine is, but in any case, it used to be a way to refer uh, people to the quit line. Um, now we have e-referral, uh, a lot of work we did in Wisconsin to get that going, and this is an article that describes that. Um, and if you're on Epic, um, you could work with your IT people to pull down a um, e-referral to the um, Vermont quit line uh, functionality, um, and that could be as an opt-in or an opt-out, and, and um, I'm not sure who does your clinical work here, but that is such a natural and really easy to do. It's a, it's a small lift to get to that. Um, a, a lot of work, in fact, some work that, that John Hughes is, is responsible for talks about pre-quit use of NRT um, and reduction counseling. So the idea here is a lot of people just, the idea of setting a quit date is very daunting. But for many of them um, to say, you know, you're not ready to quit now, how about you just put a patch on every day um, and put it on and just see how it goes and then see them back in a month. Um, and it's remarkable how many people get a sense of empowerment by this, knowing um, you know, implicitly or explicitly that they're, you know, th this nicotine is really driving a lot of that behavior. Um, so um, this is this is something you could do along with a little counseling. It says you might want to just try to smoke a, some fewer cigarettes per day. We've started a program in Wisconsin where, for all the smokers in a health system, we just mail them a two-week box of nicotine patches. We just use the EHR to get all the smokers. We mail it out, and we say, you know, you know, at some point you were a smoker. Put this on your medicine shelf. If you ever wake up and feel like quitting. You have something to turn to, and then you can see your doctor or your clinician or call the quit line or one of the other things. So, um, and this shows this idea, this is one of the meta-analyses, um, that pre-quit use of NRT really mattered, a uh, odds ratio of 2.5. Um, Long-term use of NRT, this data is more equivocal, but at least through six months, you boost quit rates by keeping people on um, medication uh, for six months rather than the typically prescribed three months. You lose a lot of these effects um, beyond that, but you get the person who has the experience of being smoke-free for quite a while. E-health and M-health, I talked a little bit about this, but I want to really emphasize um, th this issue of documentation within the EHR. Uh, what's really key about documenting it is that it prompts an a alert using Epic Speak, a BPA that will then drive some clinician behavior. That's uh, really key. Um, here's you know just some other smart sets that we've built for Epic. Um, I wanted to tell you about the National Cancer Institute suite of services. Um, it's all under the umbrella of smokefree.gov. Um, it is the most widely used web resource in the nation to help people to quit. And here are some of the things they have. So they have just the, the websites. Um, they have programs for women. They have programs for teens, for Spanish-speaking people, for vets, for pregnant women. And then they have a whole series of text-based programs all of this, of course, is free of charge. Text-based programs for targeted audience, teens, adults, 
uh, uh, new mothers, vets, etc. And again, it's an incredibly light touch program, but it's so easy. And it has the potential to be a population-based approach. And particularly for a big challenge we're having with quit lines these days is nobody picks up their phone anymore, particularly if they don't recognize the number. So the proportion of people who we refer to quit lines who actually pick up the phone and get the counseling is incredibly low. In most instances, below 30% now. Most people read texts. And uh, thus, a text-based program might be a way to go, particularly among younger populations. Um, E-cigarettes, I'm not going into that um, sinkhole, but I will say a couple things, and this is stuff that we published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, their current science, you know, it's pretty limited. Um, with that said, the risks of e-cigarettes clearly appear to be less than the risks of burning tobacco. So I want to say that again. The risks of e-cigarettes are clearly less than the risks of tobacco. But there are enormous public health concerns. Um, uh, youth, um, the fact that 40% in some samples of high school seniors using e-cigarettes is a giant public health uh, challenge to us. Um, that most e-cigarette users are not switching from cigarettes to e-cigarettes, but using both. So they've become dual users. Um, this whole enormous media um, um, activity around um, EVALI, which is this acute lung injury thing, um, that we've we've get updates from the CDC every Thursday. There have been 50 deaths. There have been 2,500 cases. And what it appears, and this is really important for all of us to know as, as opinion leaders, is that it appears to be almost exclusively a result not of typical e-cigarettes in the nicotine, but rather what particularly young people are adding to their pods in the way of THC and oils. The THC is often in oils and vitamin E oil. So it is this viscous oil that gets into the lungs and destroys them. Um, and um, it's tragic to see him. We had a patient in, in Wisconsin, one of the earliest patients, um, and to see what it did to him. But we can't lose sight of the fact that this is an acute problem with things being added to um, these e-cigarette pods. And I make that point for the following reason. Um, there's been a lot of movement to ban e-cigarettes. And everyone has to decide where they feel about that issue. But we have a lot of people who have switched from, e from combustibles to e-cigarettes or are smoking fewer combustibles that if we were to ban e-cigarettes, what we're going to do is have the unintended consequence of people maybe smoking more combustibles. Not maybe, I think it's highly likely. Um, and what I always come back to is since the 40 deaths from Evali, 48 deaths from Evali in the 2,500 cases, over this four-month period, 100,000 Americans have died from combustible tobacco use. They're dying quietly, they're dying tragically, and they're dying slowly, and they're not getting any attention. And we've got to keep a big picture around this issue. All right. Um, and we wrote about this um, in the New England Journal of Medicine in a perspective. This was actually prior to Evali, but this whole notion of targeting combustible tobacco use. I'm very passionate about that. We've got to keep our eyes on the prize. What is killing people? What is killing the most people? And it, unfortunately, is burning cigarettes. All right, so some of the policies. We know that increasing price. Um, here are the taxes across the states. Uh, Vermont, you're number seven. Good job, Vermont. You're um, higher than Wisconsin, so I was happy to see that. Um, and, of course, the range from Missouri at 17 cents to Washington, D.C. at 450. Um, Smoke-free indoor air policies are powerful. 
can't be emphasized enough. We're now a year into the HUD policy where all health, um, housing and urban development, housing units that are uh, multi-unit housing are smoke-free. Um, and that's dramatically ch changing what's happening in a population where there's a lot of smoking. Um, here are smoke-free um, cities and states. Um, and as you can see, this, the, the tobacco belt in the south are where we don't have smoke-free indoor air laws. Media campaigns really matter. You've got one um, in, in Vermont around your quit line, but the CDC um, has one with tips. The FDA has real cost. Legacy has truth. Um, the Affordable Care Act, another um, quiet way to advance this, because the Affordable Care Act says that all Preventive Services Task Force A and B recommendations have to be covered 100% without copay. And many of our insurers are not following that mandate. Um, so we try to uh, define it for insurers. This is uh, a, 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 a graphic directly out of another New England Journal of Medicine perspective that says what we have to do if we want to cover tobacco use appropriately is cover it at least twice a year, cover it for both counseling and medicine. And that is now codified. And if any of you are dealing with an insurer, you could refer... Uh, to this New England Journal of Medicine article that talks about the opportunities created by the Affordable Care Act. And we, I'm happy to make any of these slides available. Um, and our website has all of this stuff, CTRI, um, www.ctri.wisc.edu. And I'll show you that at the end. Um, meaningful use um, um, is an ONC policy office of the National Court of coordinator for information technology, which basically says that every electronic health record must include a systematic way to document tobacco use status. So again, these policies that really make a difference. I'm not going to talk about meaningful use. And I'm going to end so we have plenty of time for questions um, with a couple words on pulling it all together. So here's I started by showing you the slide of just uh, the last 50 years, but if you take tobacco use, and this is cigarette consumption measured as per capita, um, what you see is that cigarettes were incredibly uncommon at the beginning of the last century. Um, and a couple things happened then. Um, one was um, the safety match was invented and it became easy to light a cigarette. Another thing is um, machine-made cigarettes. So we didn't just have primarily African-American women rolling them manually in the, the Southeast, but they actually had machines that would make them en masse, put 20 of them in a pack and sell them. Um, and it, it's an incredibly profitable product. But then the third one, the most deadly one, was the tobacco industry began mass marketing it and um, was able to get us as a generation um, um, totally addicted to tobacco with the biggest increase occurring in the 40s when the tobacco industry was smart enough to provide free cigarettes to all American troops. And a whole generation of young men uh, became addicted during that phase. Luckily, with the Surgeon General's report, we started turning things around. But as mentioned, we still have 13.7% uh, uh, smoking, and that represents 34 million Americans. 34 million Americans mean that um, over 15 million Americans, if they don't quit, are going to die from a disease directly caused by their smoking. And to me, this warrants continued, wide-scale, emergency-focused um, response. And I think back to a time when I was just, um, this was actually just before I was born, um, the polio epidemic, uh, the early 1950s. Um, these are some pictures from some hospitals in Boston where I'm from. 
and the eye and lungs. Um, these are these are wards from Mass General Hospital and Boston City Hospital, where um, these people who developed polio they lost use of their diaphragm and were put in eye and lungs, um, and it was a miserable existence. And, and, and virtually all of them ultimately died from this. Uh, this individual. 